Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Windward Academy and Inlight Institute webinar today entitled Quarantine Agers Strategies for Coping with an Uncertain Fall Semester. We will go ahead and get started. First thing that we wanted to do was just give some thank yous to organizations that helped make today's presentation possible. So first, just thank you to Zoom for partnering with us so that we could have our educational content reach a larger audience. Also just wanted to give a quick thank you and background to Inlight Institute. So Inlight Institute is a nonprofit that offers programs to empower youth to care about themselves, others, and the world around them. So their platform strives to prevent youth violence and address mental health risks through education, empathy, and kindness so that children can excel in adulthood. So given the nature of today's presentation, they were a perfect partner for us. And our guest today, Dr. Valerie Rock, is on the board of Inlight Institute. And today's presentation would not be possible without them. So we just wanna give a big thank you to those who made today possible. I don't know why this isn't, there we go. Okay, so first some intros and welcome. So I'm Dr. Jennifer Winward, the founder and CEO of Winward Academy. Again, we're really excited to host today's presentation. I have to be very honest with all of you that a lot of the conversations that I've been having with parents lately have kind of reached the limit of my professional area of expertise. Just given how much stress and anxiety, you know, normally revolves around academics and school and college readiness. I mean, those were all things that I felt very capable for the past 20 years of, of answering for families. But given that um, the current situation with COVID-19 and school closures and so much uncertainty about fall and college and it's just a lot uh, for everyone. And it definitely kind of, again, as I mentioned, reached the limit of what I felt I could professionally support. Hence why we have invited Dr. Rock to join us because she has that level of expertise working with young people, helping them with anxiety. And in her professional practice, she's been hearing kind of all of these same questions. And so the hope for today is that she will be able to impart some of that wisdom from those conversations that she's having, again, to help you all develop some strategies to know how to cope with all of the uncertainties coming in fall semester. So we do have some uh, Q&A planned today that she and I will go through together, and then we'll go ahead and open up to your questions that you can, of course, put in the Q&A at any time. So what are our goals for today? So our goals for today, as I've kind of previously mentioned, number one, we wanna provide insights into how to manage these new challenges for fall semester, right? Continued online learning, hybrid learning, it's kind of nonstop when it comes to the unknowns and the uncertainties. So again, we wanna provide some insights to help you manage that process. Um, we're also, of course, inviting you, all of our attendees, to join a virtual discussion to ask questions about how families can manage stressors and anxiety during this unprecedented time. And again, I know that the, the main focus today is on mental health and psychological stressors. So Dr. Rock is going to be our amazing guest uh, speaker who helps answer those questions. And I'll look for times that I can hopefully chime in as well to give some advice about managing academic stressors. Uh, what we want to do to start today is provide a list of lots of resources for you. So we'll go ahead and copy and paste into the Q&A so that they're at the top and always easy to find. But we will kind of start by just giving uh, tons of URLs and uh, resources for all of you to look into. Again, we want to just do it at the beginning in case some of you might hop off uh, during the call. So you'll be able to find that information really easily. One quick thing too about this Koru mindfulness class. So I was asked to, to share information about this uh, on the call. Uh, Koru mindfulness is actually a practice that was developed at Duke University. And it's this mindfulness program that's all geared for specifically adolescents and college age students. So if you are looking for something to do once a week for four weeks, uh, every Tuesday from four to 5.15 Pacific time, uh, we are putting the link with more information about that class uh, in uh, the Q&A chat as well. Once again, as we're going through today, please feel free to jump in and ask any questions. 
And now it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Rock to all of you. So Dr. Valerie Rock has her PsyD in clinical psychology. She emphasized children and families. Uh, she has over 20 years of experience in the field of clinical psychology, helping individuals overcome stress, anxiety, depression, right? Basically what is increasing rapidly in our society now, given all of the stressors that we're facing. She has done work with uh, school systems, with inpatient hospitals, forensics, outpatient therapy, immigration, family law. Her practice has really touched a lot of those areas. And she's also corroborated with media outlets and kind of shared her training and her knowledge of adolescents with different television networks, including NBC and A&E. So again, thank you to Inlight Institute. Thank you to Dr. Rock for being with us today. And we will go ahead and jump right into questions. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Dr. Rock, can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Great. Yes, I can. All right. Thank you again for, for being with us and for sharing your expertise. I'll go ahead and jump right into some questions for you, if that's okay. Um, so a lot of, of conversations right now that people are having are surrounding kind of the, the freshman year experience. And a lot of students are very concerned about challenges that they're going to face, whether or not they can live in the dorms, whether or not they can socialize with friends, if they can even go to a physical class, or if they're going to maybe live close to campus and do everything virtually. So I'd love if you could start sharing some stories about some of your college going students whom you see in your practice and what advice are you giving to them sure yes i have many of them right now as you can imagine that's been on the forefront of everyone's mind right now especially those freshmen going into uh, college this fall so some of the stories i've heard are you know just kind of the roller coaster that people are dealing with when it comes to what they heard that they could do initially was to go in person and then they were told like sorry it's going to be online after all so it's been a roller coaster there no longer able to live in the dorms when they um, can't necessarily afford outside housing that's been a financial stressor of course losing roommates you know it takes a lot of uh, a preparation finding who you think might be the perfect roommate and then suddenly that falls apart as well and then also just grappling with the idea of continuing to live with parents during a time when they are seeking autonomy and independence you know that's a that's a it could be a letdown for some when they're really trying to find that independence and then some are able to return to school i have a couple of clients who have discussed that but they are um, needing to quarantine at least 14 days before they can even step foot on campus so that's been a struggle too, as far as resources. Not everyone can stay in a hotel for 14 days and what do they do then? And just you know, trying to figure that all out has been very stressful. And more than anything, the overarching theme has been the uncertainty, which research shows uncertainty is more stressful than a negative predicted outcome. So that has been the biggest theme I've been seeing the most is just dealing with the uncertainty. Hmm. Yeah. And is there anything that you've shared with them about conversations that they've had with their parents or with people at their universities that has maybe helped some of them cope with some of that uncertainty? Well, I think the, the first off advice I, I usually give is control what you can and manage what you can't. And there are things that are within control. And um, when it comes to anxiety and worry, the way worry works is it wants you to stop what you're doing, do nothing, avoid, try and eliminate, just run away from it. So my biggest advice is to take action over avoidance, to maybe join some online forums, join Facebook groups, send emails to administration trying to figure things out. Sometimes it's just better, they figure, I don't wanna do that, it's just easier to not do anything. Um, to stay connected. I have a couple of clients right now that want to rush a fraternity or sorority, but they don't feel it's the traditional way to do it and they don't want to, but I encourage them to do so, that things are different, it may not be traditional, but you want to stay connected and you don't want to avoid because that just grows anxiety. That's the way worry works. It grows when you try to avoid or eliminate. So my great, biggest advice is just to move forward and to problem solve versus ruminate. Anxiety is a very internal process and that can cause a lot of rumination and just uh, keeping it inside. And eventually it has to come out one way or another. So the, the, the main uh, point there is to learn to 
to uh, tolerate the discomfort of uncertainty and to, to really push through it. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, what you shared about the different challenges that, you know, all your students are facing, these are things that sometimes we don't even think about, right? What is it going to be like trying to rush a sorority or fraternity or not being able to live on campus? And it's just, it's, it's a huge part of what young people are doing and exploring, and it's a part of their identity. And so it's, it's so understandable, right, why these things have, have been very stressful for families. It is. It's been very stressful, and I know that parents are feeling the stress as well. So it's it's helpful if they can talk about these things and, and really get into those conversations and if there is a need to talk to someone for outside support as well and that's that's a, a good thing to do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so what if we shift for a second and focus on maybe high schoolers right because high school families are anxious about learning loss, not being prepared for college, kids falling behind because of virtual learning, you know, concern about lack of support from schools. Basically, you know, to your main point, it's just a time of much higher anxiety for youth. So what advice do you have for teens who are experiencing more anxiety during this time? Well, what I've seen on top of anxiety as well is the uh, lack of motivation that kids are reporting right now too in the summer that you know, they're, they're not feeling motivated now, so how are they gonna feel motivated come online learning? Mm -hmm. And um, there's a lot, of, a lot of things I tell kids when it comes to motivation, because I'm seeing, gosh, even last week, I think it was one client after another said, you know, I just can't get myself to do my summer reading. I can't do the math I need to do. You know, some schools assign this during the summer. So when it comes to cognitive behavioral therapy, that is a way to change the way you think about things so you can change the way you feel about things. So I, I incorporate a lot of that when it comes to therapy. And when it comes to motivation, I talk a lot about, a, a, and this is also how I advise people to be procrastination, is to think of it differently. Oftentimes we think, okay, I, I gotta wait till I feel like doing something. I gotta wait till I feel like reading and then I'll, I'll produce something. But the way it really needs to go is first action. Do something first and then you start to feel motivated and then there's more action. So you start with just taking the first step, get a little bit of production going, then you realize, okay, this isn't so bad. And then that can lead to more action. And next thing you know, you're on a roll. So you don't wanna think the old way of, oh, I'll just, I don't, I'll wait till I feel like doing it. That's putting the cart before the horse. So just even taking the first step is a success because it will eventually lead you to feel more motivated. And as far as, um, you know, with, with parents, the conversation is, well, as a family, let's talk about what did work in the spring. You know, how, what can we do to replicate that? And what changes do we need to make? And keep it positive. We don't, we want to watch the language we use with our kids too, that they're not harsh words like, oh, it was a disaster last year. Because kids hear that, they soak it up, and then they start to think that's how it's going to be. That's what we call fortune telling in, in cognitive behavioral therapy, just arbitrarily predicting that things are going to turn out badly. So we want to refrain from catastrophizing, refrain from fortune telling, and just think about how you're going to do it differently this time if what you did didn't work and what, and what did work and make a plan. Mm -hmm. And one follow-up question. So you mentioned, you know, students who are lacking motivation, like I just can't get started on my math. I just can't get started on my summer reading. You said that sometimes just starting and taking that first step in action is really good at propelling them to get back into the rhythm. If a student is struggling to start his or her reading, is that first step action that you're describing to actually read? Or are you saying that there are other things that they could do that would then motivate them to do their reading? You know, it can start as simple as, what's my first step? It can be, I just need to take my book out of my book bag and then think about the next step and break it down into parts. And then, okay, I'm actually reading. Well, I'll, I'll commit to reading two chapters today. And then once they do their two chapters, if they need to keep going, they can. And I can also relate that to some of the lack of motivation that some of my kids or my clients are feeling when it comes to um, their athletics. You know, right now I'm hearing, oh, I just don't even want to exercise. I'm not feeling it. I'm just not motivated. I'm not working out with my team. So I, I recommend that they do um, what I call better than nothing goals. 
just set some small goals and say, okay, well, I'm, my, my goal today is just to run half a mile. And then once you get to that half mile, great, then it was better than just sitting on the couch today. But nine times out of 10, once you get there, you start to do more and you feel good about it and it just produces more. So there's a lot of, a lot of tricks you can use when it comes to kind of motivating yourself. Mm, that's great. Um, I want to shift now and focus more on kind of the social aspect of some of the anxiety that people are facing, right? So we all know that time with friends is so essential for teens, right? That there's a lack of connection to others. Teens are feeling more lonely. They're feeling more isolated. So what advice do you give to teens who miss their friends? Yeah, and that is certainly a common theme as well. You know, kids are not seeing their friends face to face like they used to, and they um, sometimes are just choosing to isolate because that's part of what the anxiety and worry is doing for them. Again, worry says stop, shut down, and it takes a little bit of energy to actually reach out to friends, and that's typically when they need to do it the most is when they are feeling isolated, when they're seeing some signs of social withdrawal that reaching out to a friend, whether it's text or, you know, most of it is of course virtual now, but to try and connect with friends on a deeper level and get creative with some of that stuff. You know, some of my clients have, they play fun games when they, when they call each other or get on FaceTime, like, you know, the younger ones, would you rather games and just getting to know each other better and book of questions kinds of things. And it's, it's been fun to see some of the creativity that they can come up with but it is very important that they stay connected. We, I know it's called social distancing, but a lot of professionals are making a push to call it physical distancing. You know, that we stay physically apart, but socially connected because that is a very big key as a protective factor for mental health. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then what about parents, right? So obviously students are struggling because they're again feeling more lonely and isolated from their friends but parents are also very concerned about just the social and emotional development that typically happens during this time so what advice do you have for parents who are maybe worried about the impact of covid on their kids social and emotional development yeah and i'll preface it by saying um kids are definitely more resilient than we think that they are you know, they are malleable, they are flexible, they're able to adjust to situations. This so far has not been a prolonged um, event. We hope it will get better, but at this point, it's still okay that they, they're doing what they're doing. And as I mentioned, you know, still staying connected with friends is helpful. You know, a couple of other ideas too is to stay creative, to be connected to their creativity. Like some kids are actually, uh, getting on FaceTime and doing uh, jam sessions with their musical instruments with friends and, you know, still staying connected in that way. Um, I have one client right now who's learning to crochet and do things. But I think right now, this is a very valuable time, an opportunity for kids to really engage in life skills. And I think that that can promote social and emotional well-being more than anything, too. This is an opportunity where kids can start you know, we're always so busy with sports, extracurriculars, academics, that a lot of kids just don't even have time to learn the basics, which it could be, you know, they find a new skill of cooking, or just something simple like sewing a button, or changing a tire, or things that they may need when they get to college, you know, making sure their laundry is done correctly, and um, learning to drive. We know that with this I generation, kids are prolonging their uh, learning to drive, not like when we were younger, when that's all we we're excited to do. So this is a really good time to promote autonomy and independence with our kids. And I think that will foster the emotional and social development more than anything. And we have to view it as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a good um, life skills story from college. My, my roommate, uh, well, we were roommates freshman year and then we lived together the rest of college. But when we got our first apartment, she put Dawn dish soap into the dishwasher. <laughs> instead of you no know, cascade and we just had you know a sea of bubbles all over our floor so anyway maybe it's never too early to uh to learn some of those things that's exactly right and these are kids uh, these are skills that kids are going to need to learn anyway you know they're, yes. they're going to have to figure it out and this is a good time for parents to kind of hands off and, and be okay with that discomfort as well to tolerate that that you know kids have to fall 
and, and pick themselves up. We can't always do it for them. And, you know, this is a safe place to do it while they're at home and they can learn and figure it out. That's how their brains are growing and learning. Mm -hmm. And let's take a moment and focus on parents, right? This is also a really hard time for parents. They're feeling hopeless. They're feeling overwhelmed. They're burned out. I mean, a lot of parents themselves are struggling, trying to balance the responsibility of teaching their kids, making decisions about their kids' futures while also attempting to work from home. So what advice do you have for parents? Well, yes, it is certainly overwhelming right now. We cannot deny that about anyone going through this. You know, everyone is dealing with worry. So I think it's helpful just to know that it is a general feeling amongst parents that everyone is trying to figure it out. And um, as the saying goes, anxious parents, anxious kids, worry is contagious. So I really encourage my parents to engage in their own self-care, to make sure that they are taking care of themselves and that they are staying socially connected in their ways as well. I think it's helpful when moms and dads get together and they kind of share their stories and they connect in that way and they realize they're not alone with that. And if they are fortunate enough to uh, be at home where there's two parents working from home and two people can be helping out. It's helpful to help with the burnout in that they take turns sharing responsibilities. You know, someone can kind of watch over what's going on with the kids while the other's working and then trade off and take care of pet responsibilities and domestic duties and just really have a partnership in that way if possible. But I think it's good for parents to model how to deal with the uncertainty and handling bad news and again to watch the messages that we're giving our, our kids you know and take your own breaks you know be be um aware when you're starting to feel that way and say okay i need my own time out now and i'm just going to take some space for myself and more than anything i want parents to keep in mind that every family has different needs to resist that comparison that the choices for one family might not be a good choice for another family because it's real easy to get into that comparison and to start to freak out like oh my gosh i'm not doing what they're doing and i don't have these tutors or i don't have this and um when you make decisions you want to do it when you're all when you're in a calm state you know decisions that are made while they're emotionally charged usually don't go well so to to really self-assess and, and understand when you're starting to get to that point and to do something about it and engage in mindfulness too, as I mentioned, you know, that's a, a very great stress reducer is to, to engage in meditation and any kind of mindfulness activities. It's really helpful for the burnout. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, yeah, super helpful insights. I know sometimes for parents, you know, we're, they're, sometimes even when they're talking to their friends, it just is, they need that connection as well, right? To talk about their shared concerns, to talk about, you know, resources and ideas to support their kids, to share that information. But then also what I like that you mentioned that's really important is to recognize that sometimes what works for another family doesn't necessarily work for your family. And I think that that's a great just extra tip for, for families to remember right now, because it does, you naturally compare, right? Yeah. It's kind of our tendency to do that. So I think having that good mental check of this might be great for my best friend's family, but is it the right thing for my family? And, and being mindful of that as well, I think is, is really, really important to emphasize. Yeah, that's exactly right. And you know your kids best, you know what their needs are. And some, even within families, they have different needs. And if that means that you have to get extra support for one child over another, then that's the way it has to be. Mm -hmm. And you just have to, again, make these decisions when you're in a calm state and, you know, with so much news going around, and so much chatter, it's easy to get in that anxious state where you're just not thinking clearly. Mm -hmm. So it's important, again, to really to kind of weather the storm, but do it in a way that feels like it's in, in a, a good decision making environment for yourself and your significant other. Mm -hmm. Um, next question is kind of about, you know, at what point should a parent or a teen seek professional support with anxiety? Like when do they know, okay, this is more taking a more serious toll. Are there any things that they should be on the lookout for to know kind of when that's the right time? 
Well, so, well, some, some of the symptoms of anxiety, and like I said, we're all dealing with stress right now, but anxiety just puts it to the next level. And some of those signs are if you see you yourself or your, your children that seem to be excessively worried, if they're ruminating and it's, it's you know, sometimes irrational worries, um, if there's loss of sleep or appetite, and sometimes it can be manifested through, or oftentimes through physical symptoms, which can be headaches, nausea, chest pain, you know, anxiety really does its thing with, its bo with the body, and that's a sure sign that you know, something, something else is going on, especially if you go to the pediatrician and they don't find anything going on, then that might be a sign. And of course, if there's ever any talk of any kind of um, uh, harm to self or you know, any kind of suicidal ideation, of course, that's a very strong indicator. I need professional help as soon as possible. But these are things to look out for. And usually coupled with that, sometimes untreated anxiety will turn into a depressive disorder too. And a lot of those are some of the same symptoms too of lack of sleep and appetite and um, so social isolation and just lack of energy, oversleeping or not sleeping at all. So those are some of the things to look out for. But, you know, if your child says, hey, I just want someone to talk to and I think it's nice to talk to someone who's a third party outside unbiased person, then that's great too. You know, something doesn't have to necessarily be really wrong. Sometimes you just want it, your child to learn extra tools or to be able to um, just have that space for themselves to talk to someone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, you know, so let's say there's a parent who wants to start a conversation with his or her daughter about anxiety or about depression. Are there any prompts or conversation starters that parents could use to get their teens to open up about how they're feeling? Sure. Well, you know, not all, all the times do kids even understand what they're feeling. And sometimes they just think I feel odd or I'm off. I'm not sure what's going on. So sometimes just talking with your children about emotions in general and um, or just mentioning some casual observations. Hey, I see that you're not really um, reaching out to your friends like you used to. Is there something going on? Do we need to talk about something? Or if they start to describe an emotion, sometimes just naming that emotion, contain it as well to say, oh, this is what anxiety means. I didn't know what that was. And by the way, a lot of people out there have this same feeling too. And oftentimes it's helpful too when kids do shut down and they don't want to talk mm -hmm. is to just start the conversation with your own experience, a, a genuine connection in that. I remember a time when I was your age and this is what happened and how I felt or just to kind of relive a time when you felt nervous and there was a challenge, but you overcame it. And sharing your experience can really open those doors too. And being able to, um, to uh, do it in a non-judgmental way too and to, you know, just really listen and say, okay, well, if, if you feel like this is something we can work out within our family. But I think more than anything, telling kids, I don't know what's going to happen either come fall. We are going to do this together. We're going to pull from the resources that we have, and we're going to, we're going to get through this together. You know, we have to, uh, to get, go through it to get through it. And this is what we're going to do together. And I think just letting them know they're not alone and that you'll do what you can to help them. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, so what I want to do next is just uh, check if we have any questions. I think in the chat that we were able to copy and paste a lot of the, the resources. So again, anybody who's joining us who's looking for those URLs for different ideas. Um, it looks like we do have a question here. So what advice do you have for parents with teens who are diagnosed already with anxiety and or depression and are physically distanced from friends and are homebound? Okay, so I guess that would, I would follow up with a question if they're already seeing a professional for, for help with that. Um, and if so, I think it's really important that that professional engage the parents as well, because anxiety is a family thing. This, it has to start with the um, foundation of family all being on board, because like I mentioned before, oftentimes it's anxious parents, anxious kids. So um, just kind of looking at what's going on in the family dynamics too is really helpful. And, um, you know, they already have a diagnosis, maybe they are seeing a professional. 
and uh, kind of using those resources that are available and trying to get them socially connected. You know, sometimes parents, it just depends on the age. You know, sometimes they do have to play a little bit of a hand in that. Like, hey, we're going to go to the beach today. If you want to invite your friend to get in the water with you, that's great. You know, I'm, I'm happy to help with that. And just to really and then take a take a stand with that and, and push a little bit to get a little bit more socially connected and it kind of just depends on what the um, what the issues are in the moment you know if it's just social isolation or if there's any um, if there's a lot of negative thinking going on then like I said mindfulness can be really helpful or cognitive behavioral therapy which is looking at the way kids think because it just impacts the way they feel and oftentimes they can be uh, glasses half empty kind of thinkers. So we want to really examine the way their thoughts are working and, and you know, how it's operating within their system. Okay, great. Let me see what other questions we have here. Um, are you finding many high school grad students staying closer to home uh, for fall semester due to COVID-19 with many being online? So I guess that's kind of more just a question of do we find high school grads are choosing to live at home or stay closer to home because their classes are online? Uh, I don't know about you, but I've kind of seen a mix. I've seen mm -hmm. some kids that are still being on, going online, but also choosing to, to move close to their school mm -hmm. just so that they can potentially meet up with other students there, although it's limited. And if that's possible, that's great. Um, but I, I would say right now what I've seen, it's most, it's probably half and half. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I would say the same answer about 50, 50. Some are kind of saying, you know, if I'm not going to be able to live on campus, I'm not gonna be able to have that experience. I'll stay home. I have other students, same thing, like at UCLA, they weren't able to get housing as freshmen. So they've, you know, joined a Facebook group of UCLA uh, freshmen try to find people and then they're trying to find apartments in LA where they can live together and at least, you know, try to again, build that social environment, even though they'll be, you know, all zooming from, from the, the apartment to join classes since they won't be able to go on campus. Right. But I'd say I, I've, I've seen the same, same patterns. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so this looks like a specific question about San Diego Unified. I might be able to help with this one too. It says, since San Diego Unified School District has not published how online learning will be accomplished, we don't know what that will be like at this time. However, I'm concerned that the districts may not have enough time to develop an effective plan. What recourse do parents and students have to affect change? Where can we start? I'm happy to take some for that question or if you have any thoughts or if you've seen similar concerns. I'll defer to you for, for that question and maybe I can add on at the end. Okay. So one thing that I will say is that, you know, one of the challenges, right, for a lot of the schools that are in these big public districts is that a lot of the individual schools kind of hands are tied where they can't really make any decisions right now until the unions finish their negotiations with the districts and until the districts basically make their decisions and then that can trickle down. Um, based on, you know, internal discussions that I've had with some principals of San Diego Unified, it seems like they're hoping to have some decisions in the next couple weeks. I can imagine that for parents, they would have loved to have that information two weeks ago, right? Not in two more weeks. So I would say that as much as possible, you know, to Dr. Rock's point of just trying to be a part of supporting your students, we're in this together, we're going to learn when we learn. I mean, in terms of affecting change, I think, you know, working with the student parent organization at your student school, I mean, they tend to have more information of, of what's going on. So you could look to get involved maybe in that, that parent organization for your student school. You might be able to get insights. You might be able to offer ideas there that could then make their way up to, to the decision makers. Um, but that would probably be my advice. And then as much as possible, you know, trying to build a plan around, you know, when school starts, what is the structure that you're going to want to have in your home? Because we don't know yet how much structure we're going to get from the schools in terms of how frequently classes are meeting. I mean, I know that teachers want to see a change from what happened in the spring 
Um, and so they're, you know, working hard to try to make sure that they can connect more with students and, and have more structure, which is what it sounds like this question was really about, right? How can we have a better sense of the structure to expect? So I would say, I guess, you know, unfortunately, we're just kind of have to sit tight, see what decisions are made in the next few weeks. And then maybe in the interim, you could look at getting involved more in the school organization and, and you might be able to get more information. Dr. Rock, did you have any other insights on that? Um, yeah, I just want to springboard a little bit off of what you said in, in terms of taking action, as I mentioned before, action over avoidance or mm -hmm. rumination, because it does help to do your research and to get involved and see what's out there and um, just kind of get an idea, knowing that a lot of it is not within our control. Uh, and then in terms of the structure, when it when we are online and everyone's at home trying to make it work, I think there's some really helpful strategies that can um, be put in place in the house. And that is to, you know, again, develop a routine that kids can follow and that they can also be a part of in making this routine and to um, have a little bit of flexibility with it too and, and be realistic about this routine and, and give it a trial run the first day. If it doesn't seem, if it seems like we're trying to cram too much in a day, kids will drop out of the routine if it feels too stressful. So having some flexibility with that and staying away from any kind of rigid, uh, thinking and then also, um, you know, setting up good workspaces and I'm sure you talk to families about this a lot too and, you know, separating your um, workspace from your bed or your couch because you don't want to pair the two together. It can cause sleep issues and there's many reasons to not do that, but to, um, you know, make sure that, and I know it can be challenging when everyone's home in the house and, you know, simply in the morning, get dressed, <laughs> have your kids get out of their pajamas and you as well. And just to kind of have the mindset of, yes, we are going to school and this is our day. And just being, um, you know, creating that structure for kids. They're just, they crave it so much. And just to, to make the plan together, empower them. This is what we're going to do. And again, as I mentioned earlier, talk about what worked in the spring and how you're going to make it work in the fall and what you're going to add to it. And, and, make adjustments as necessary. So that's I know that kind of went off a little bit on a tangent, but I think it's no, a, no, that's it's right. the, the structure piece of it when it comes to kind of being in a mental state to, to start online. Yeah, and something too that I can add to the idea of kind of a good workspace to echo your point. I always tell my students they're not allowed to learn while lounging right yeah. not not while you're on the couch not while you're lying in bed you need to sit at a desk have it clear no plates with dirty food no snack wrappers right try to maintain a clear workspace organize your pens and pencils and highlighters really well lit too i think sometimes people don't think enough about lighting in a workspace so just as much as possible kind of addressing these things and of course in an ideal situation you have this dedicated space it, you know, where it's quiet as well, where you can work and kind of have this dedicated, I'm going to be very focused sitting here space. And then the other areas of your home can be where you can feel a little disconnected from that, where you can relax more and kind of focus on more family time and fun uh, versus sometimes feeling like you have to learn in, in, in those same spaces. Sure. And I'm, I'm a big believer in taking those breaks too, you know, maybe setting the timer for every 90 minutes or whatever it might be, just according to age and taking that five to 10 minutes to stretch, go outside, get some fresh air, a little sun, and, and getting back into it because those breaks are really good for the mind for the reboot and reset. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing too I'll add about breaks because I think a lot of teens, their tendency is they've been on their Zoom class for an hour and then they get a five minute break and the first thing they do is grab their cell phone, start texting, scrolling. Mm -hmm. I mean, our eyes need a break from the screen. So even though that might be that natural tendency as much as possible to encourage your students for their breaks to be from all screens, um, to your point, to get up, to move around, to go outside, to get a healthy snack, to get some water, um, even just putting cold water on your face can be a really good way to kind of wake yourself up. Also kind of a random tip, but peppermint as an aromatherapy is very good at stimulating the mind. So sometimes even chewing minty gum or having an Altoid um, or even smelling, you know, a little aromatherapy peppermint can be really good at just kind of waking up the mind and, and getting yourself fresh again. Good tip. Yes, it's my tip for during the break on the ACT and SAT, what all my students are supposed to do. Um, okay, let's see. 
We have another question. Both the adults and the kids in our household are dealing with strange sleep issues during this time period. They're having trouble falling asleep and they're having problems staying asleep. What tips do you have for that? Well, there could be several factors involved with that. And um, my first thought is what's going on with the electronics? You know, I, I've given some talks about uh, media and how to manage it. And one of my biggest tips is to keep electronics out of the bedroom at night. I don't know if there's any of that going on. I'm not sure what ages these kids are, but to charge the phone in a different room because if those notifications are going off or blue light, even if it's on silent, it still will disrupt the sleep and, and you know, get a, into that REM sleep. And um, trying to shut it down at least one hour before going to bed, going to sleep, and just kind of maybe reading or doing something that will calm the mind a little bit more. And I know it's so tempting, you know, it's summer, there's not much going on. Kids are staying up much later than what they normally would. And, you know, some of that's, that's okay too. But as long as we're, when school's about to start to really start enforcing what, what time you have to get in bed and getting back into that sleep cycle. Sleep is so important for both kids and parents. It is the number one protective factor in mental health is getting good sleep, but also not to stress too much about it either. You want to make sure that it's not, you know, becoming a point of contention in the house either. And again, if I knew what ages, it might make a difference too. But I think it's important to really have that kind of routine when you start going to bed and if possible to take away the electronics an hour before actually getting into bed, just to get the mind into that, that sleep mindset. I don't know if you have anything to add on to that one. Yeah, I would just echo. So what a lot of people don't realize is that the blue wavelength light that's in a television screen and in your phone actually stimulates the mind to think that it's daylight. And so it keeps your mind awake and alert. So a couple things you can do is they, um, you know, our iPhones all have night, night mode, I think it is, where I think starting at 8 p.m. or maybe you can even set what time it shuts off the blue light in your phone. So when you look at it, it looks a little bit different, right, with the coloring, but again, it just helps to not overexpose your brain to make sure that you're able to keep and maintain a regular circadian rhythm, which is this, our uh, sleep cycles. So that's a great point. And, and again, taking that break too, because we don't have that setting on our TVs. So if you know that you're, you're gonna, gonna wanna wind down and go to bed in an hour, turning that off, taking a nice bath, you know, doing what you need to do to really try to relax and unwind can, can help. Um, okay, next question. Um, my son is really anxious about the transition to high school. Uh, he's especially worried about being academically ready, given that the last semester was cut short. What advice do you have for him? Um, yeah. Anything you want to try? I, I could talk for a whole hour webinar about just this topic. Yeah. I certainly could too. Have you seen anything specifically with those transition age, eighth grade to ninth grade that maybe you wanna offer? Sure, I mean, it's definitely age appropriate for there to be some stress and worry. Again, we're dealing with uncertainty and like you, I could talk for hours on end about worry and combating anxiety. But um, when it does come to worry, it is something that you want to, um, teach your children to tolerate and I, I don't know if I mentioned earlier but the three X's that are sometimes used with worry and that is to externalize your worry. Put it outside of you. I give my uh, clients even a recommendation to name their worry. One mm -hmm. of them named their worry Pat. So the third, second X being expect. Expect that that worry is going to show. Of course you're going to be nervous your freshman year. That's normal. Expect Pat is going to show up. And then the third X, experiment. You know, being, go with the, uh, with the behavior or, or the thing that is causing you to worry to begin with. If it's, you're afraid to talk to teachers, well, expect you're going to feel this way, but you still go talk to them and you do your life. You're going to pivot toward what's causing the worry. That's the best way to extinguish it, is to just get practice with it. So externalize, expect, and experiment. And that experiment is the same as exposure. And that's just a really quick rundown of how to deal with some of that worry. 
Mm -hmm. Let's extinguish the fourth X that is the ultimate goal. <laughs> of right, right. Three X's. Exactly. Um, extinguish it. And you know, it may not totally go away if it comes to like a fear of talking with your teachers. It may not totally go away, but it will get better. It can get better and you can get more used to it. You build the confidence and there's a sense of mastery once you've done it a few times. Mm -hmm. So it is very helpful to say you know, this is an external process that's happening and to really explain how anxiety works in the brain sometimes too, you know, there's the prefrontal cortex that's in charge of the what ifs and the future planning. And when that starts to go on overdrive, that's when it triggers the amygdala, which is the, uh, the threat response. And then comes the physical symptoms. And I'm sure you know all the, uh, the components to how anxiety works. So, you know, if you're starting to feel the physical symptoms, well, you know, here comes Pat. Pat showed up and I expected Pat to show and I'm going to pivot toward it and do it, challenge it, push through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Um, let's see, if students have a choice, not sure if this will happen, is it less stressful to spread out their school day assignments throughout the day or is it better to work on everything in a small chunk of time and then to relax later? Um, I'm, I'm happy to answer that one. Okay, so this is definitely a very personal decision. There are some students who function better and perform better if they can kind of chunk that every day from eight to 12, they're jamming on their assignments and their classes. They maybe take a one to two hour break and then come back to it in the afternoon and evening. There are other students who do better, you know, working for an hour, taking a 15 minute break, working for an hour, taking a 15 minute break. So this idea of whether you kind of work better in bigger chunks with longer breaks or shorter chunks with smaller breaks is really, really a personal decision. And to be honest, it's a great thing for high schoolers to learn before they go to college. Because in college, when you have so much more free time to manage how you study, it's kind of good when you've already figured that part out about yourself and how you like to space out your work and how you like to study and how you best learn. So my thoughts there would be, you know, explore, we have another X, explore um, that option with your kids and maybe suggest, hey, if you do have this flexibility, let's see what works better for you. You know, try to structure your day one way, try to structure it another way. Let's see where you feel more productive, where you feel more engaged, where you feel more alert and sharp as you're working. And don't be afraid to try uh, would, would be my thoughts there. And, and Dr. Rock, I don't know if you have anything to add uh, with that. Yeah, just the, as you mentioned, to your point, you know, the flexibility with that, that it doesn't have to be one way. And what might work for one child in a family may not work for the other. And you do have to experiment with that a bit. And it may take a little bit of time and you have to have a little bit of patience to, to figure it out and be open to adjustments with that too. And, you know, it sometimes works great one week and not so much the next and you just you got to roll with it and mm -hmm. kind of figure out and it can be dependent too on again you know did my child have a good night's sleep the night before then that could come into play with how mm -hmm. they're functioning the next day so there's so many factors to consider too that it's something that it's good to have some flexibility with and not stick to a really rigid model mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing too I just thought of to add because you brought up the sleep part is just nutrition. I think something else that happened as people were kind of forced into this new virtual learning environment in the spring is that people got in the habit of kind of taking little snacks all day long and didn't actually dedicate time to sitting down for a healthy, nutritious, balanced meal. And sometimes too, we don't realize how much, you know, how we take care of our bodies affects our mind, right? And so de dedicating that time to really devote to ha still having a great breakfast and having a great lunch is also just another factor to, to keep your eyes on to make sure because that excessive snacking, right? It's, it's tempting and sometimes you're working and you have a little bowl of something next to you and you don't even realize. And then the next thing you know, the bowl's gone five minutes later. I mean, it's just these things can happen, right? These habits are very natural. So as much as possible, again, just keeping your eye on those other factors that can really play a role in how you feel academically with your focus is, is really important. This next question is great. And I'm really glad it was asked because I didn't even think to, to talk to you about this. And I think it's really important. 
So what advice do you have to reassure a child who on social media is seeing friends who are not social distancing? So seeing friends who are getting together and this person is trying to socially distance. Mm -hmm. What thoughts Great do you question. have? Yes, and that has come up a lot with families that I talk to or even personal friends too because everyone has their different comfort levels and it can certainly become a point of contention, especially with teenagers who, you know, friends are their world at this point. And, um, you know, it's, it's gotta be decided. And I, I understand there is a little bit of room for compromise. You know, mm -hmm. if a parent says, I'm not comfortable with this, but then a child says, I'm not talking negotiation, but more compromise, you know, what if it's just me and one other friend and we come to our backyard? And if that feels comfortable to the parent, then so be it. And everyone has their different levels of, of comfort there. Mm -hmm. And there may be different factors as to why that is. You know, maybe there's a, a grandparent at home or whatever it is. So you have to remind your, your kids, you know, whatever our needs are, very different from what your friends might be. They might not have an elderly grandparent or someone who's immune compromised near them, or maybe you're about to take a, a trip and, and see a grandparent. So we have to be extra careful, but they might not have that. And to just kind of go through the explanation of that and, and really under, help them to understand where you're coming from as well. Mm -hmm. And there's no easy answer, really, because, you know, some parents are just more lenient in general. And that can also translate to other things, not just um, social distancing, but it can be, you know, with anything, you know, so-and-so gets to use uh, their electronics more than I do. There's always going to be those comparisons, but it's a conversation to have with your kids about your own family's comfort levels. Yeah. Yeah. This next person started by thanking you, Dr. Rock, for your super helpful tips. Uh, then the person asked, what would you do with a teen who refuses to go get professional help, but is showing signs of depression and social isolation? I've spoken to my teen about speaking to someone, but he refuses. At this point, it is difficult to make them do anything they don't want to do. And that is very true. You cannot make someone do something that they don't want to do. And if you force a kid into therapy, it's not necessarily going to be effective. Um, and there's some workarounds with that sometimes too. You know, if you can um, maybe just say, hey, let's try it one time. If you really don't like it, then okay, that's okay. We'll, we'll try and deal with your and anxiety in a different way. But sometimes it just takes the one time to go because if it is an anxiety issue, the anxiety itself could be coming into a room and talking to someone they don't know. And again, you don't wanna force it, but if you can at least say, try it once, and if it works and you feel like you can connect with this person, then we'll go from there. But not to say, you know, we're gonna have you go to therapy and you're going to get better and we're going to be somewhat rigid with this. Um, if, if they do go the one time, they still say it's not for me, then, um, you know, it's going to take a lot of parent involvement as well. And I would suggest getting a, um, a, a parent coach that can help the parent guide the, uh, the team through the anxiety and kind of doing it a little bit at home on your own. Mm -hmm. And then maybe working your way up to eventually getting in to see a professional. And yeah, sometimes even virtually, it's a little bit easier than walking into someone's room. So that's an option too. I know most therapists right now are doing virtual sessions or even talking on the phone because you don't even see this person. I'm not sure what the resistance is about, but kind of talking with those about them, what the resistances are, and then working with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, the next question, in terms of student emotional and physical well-being, how many hours do you believe should be asynchronous learning versus synchronous learning online each day? Um, I can uh, take that question. So um, what I would suggest is, again, you know, so much is going to be determined by your schools in terms of how much your students are required to be online kind of in these virtual classes versus how much flexibility they have. Um, my main kind of advice about, you know, whatever is kind of dictated for you by uh, your school. 
is to make sure that offline your students are learning really good study habits. So regardless of whether they're doing online classes for two hours a day or six hours a day or whatever, again, is kind of prescribed by the school and its um, structure and its course schedule, making sure that when your students are doing their virtual classes, that they're not just passively watching, that they're actively involved and taking notes, that they go through the process of rereading their notes, rewriting their notes, um, putting little questions in the margins if they recognize areas that they're not 100% sure of. So kind of learning those steps of recognizing where you might not be 100% on a concept, looking for those answers by talking to friends who also attended the lecture or by looking in the textbook. And then if you still can't find those answers, reaching out to your teacher and being able to clearly articulate these are the areas in which I'm still struggling. May I please find an additional time to connect with you to review these questions, All right? So kind of learning offline those really important habits that again are gonna translate really well for their success in college and career. So yes, a lot is gonna be kind of determined by your, your schools, but as much as possible to just encourage those great study habits that students can do, regardless of how many hours a day they have to be connected to their teachers. And one thing too that's really, really important is that students recognize how important it is to learn from their mistakes. So when they write an essay and it's been marked up because they need to tweak some of the grammar or work on their writing, or if they take a math quiz and they miss questions two and five, they shouldn't ignore those questions, right? They should go back. They should look at questions two and five. They should write out every single step to make sure that they know how to do those questions in the future. So again, kind of reinforcing a lot of those habits can uh, be really helpful for students to do. Okay, we have three more minutes. Let me see. Uh, we, it looks like we have one more question uh, in the chat. So let me, we'll, we'll end with this one if that's okay. It says, as a student at a private high school that decided to keep the same schedule for online as in person. So they have full class periods every day with teachers and classwork. What advice do you have for dealing with being online for that long every day, which is a long time, and then having homework to do after on top of that? So do you maybe wanna take the you know, social, emotional, mental health approach, and, and I can address maybe the academic part? Sure, yeah, that is certainly a long time to be online, and as I emphasized before, breaks are really important, and to be able to uh, time those accordingly. Uh, and after classes are over, yes, there's gonna be homework. I would say reboot, recharge then. I'm a big proponent of exercise. I think that's the best way to just kind of get your mind back into that space again. If possible, if it's work that doesn't have to be done on the computer, you know, maybe go outside, read, get a change of scenery when it comes to doing the homework, if possible. Or even if that means taking your laptop out on the patio and, and doing it there just to get a little fresh air and changing up your environment a little bit. But also knowing, it kind of, listening to your body and, and being mindful and bringing some of that into it. Listen to your, to your um, set, engage your senses. And if your back's starting to hurt and you can feel certain things in your body, get up, stretch, do a little meditation in between, you know, and it, it could be a two minute mental vacation where you just go somewhere for two minutes, a place you love, engage your sense, senses and come back in two minutes and you'll feel a, a, a difference in the mindset there. I mean, it, it is a, a great thing for stress reduction and again, movement. I'm a, a big proponent of getting some movement in, in some form of exercise or another in between mm -hmm. online to then the homework. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess that the mental health approach and the academic approach are very much aligned because you basically said everything that I was planning to, to say with this student. But one thing that I can add that echoes Dr. Rock's uh, comments. So this is just kind of a fun fact, but if you look at the way that ancient Greeks designed all of their buildings, right, they usually have a lot of stairs leading up to a library or a lot of stairs leading up to, you know, the, the civic hall for government. And the thought there was that when you have to kind of huff and puff up those stairs and get your blood going, then when you're in this space where your mind is supposed to be open, and you're supposed to be sharp, that you're in that better space. So I think it comes back to that same idea of just looking for opportunities to get up and move around, 
you know, again, anything you can do to get some kind of fresh blood pumping through your body is just so good at helping you reset your mind. And for that student who asked that question, I mean, you were talking about a, a rigorous schedule of being on the computer for the exact same time that you're in class. I mean, it is not easy. I'm sure you probably had that experience in the spring as well, because private schools really pivoted quickly to that type of format. So one last thing I would say too, is you could maybe reflect on that experience from spring recognize what worked well, recognize areas where maybe if you did things a little bit differently, it could help you bring more balance and it could help you feel more comfortable with the situation and then just embrace whatever those uh, things might be. All right, well, Dr. Rock, thank you so much to you and to Inlight Institute for being a part of our webinar today and for imparting so much wisdom and, and great advice for all of our families. So yes, I just wanna say thank you so much again. Thank you, it was my pleasure. Great, well, so nice to see you. Thank you all for joining us and uh, I hope you all have a great rest of your Wednesday. Right. Take thank care. You.